Awards. Um, right now we have with us uh, the director of one of our 10 minute plays, Dewey Scott Wiley, uh, and one of our actors and company members, Dan Boyle. Uh, we're gonna do something interesting with this uh, segment. We were originally just gonna show a preview, a read through of the play that we're working on, but the cast and director and playwright uh, suggested that it might be cool to actually see their process at work. So we recorded their rehearsal and we're gonna show you a segment now with some of the reading and some of the discussion between the actors, director, dramaturg uh, about the play. So that'll run about 23 minutes. And then following it, uh, we'll have some question and answer and discussion with Dewey, Dan and Teddy Lytle, who is also a member of that show. All right, so we're gonna share the video with you now. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Because uh, yeah, I feel like s somehow in the in the second iteration that there's a lot less times where I'm like, what, what does that mean? You know, uh, I feel I feel like it's it's much more um, kind of even handed. Like, I don't feel like I'm missing something if I'm not a gaming insider. Yeah, you know, I feel like mm -hmm. I'm included in the story already. Yeah, but that that's a great thing to kind of keep an eye on Mario. Yeah, and like, you want to make sure that that's uh, because uh, yeah, the script has the right balance, and not because we've all become a little bit more familiarized with the story. Right, that's a Which good is point. That weird balance yeah, that always exists. Yeah, yeah. It's a really good point. All right, so uh, Teddy, are you still with us, my friend? All right, cool. Um, I would love to uh, just read it one time through, and now that we're a little more familiar with it, uh, one thing we talked about the other day is maybe just like trying to keep the pace moving. Um, Right, and, and sort of, uh, yeah, just trying to find the music of the play as opposed to, don't worry about what, what you're giving me physically right now, let's just try to keep mm -hmm. the vocal energy of the play intact, you know? Help me make the music of the play. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just finished a musical theater history class, so that was very, help that was very delightful. Um, <clears throat> All right, we ready? Jim, you wanna kick us off? Stage direction wise. Unmute yourself, Jim. I'm sorry, I'm like managing all the windows. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Lights up to a normal living room for college students in the Midwest. Pizza boxes are lying around empty and stained, clothes open, Tupperware and computers are scattered through the space. Four bedrooms connect to the living room, including the master bedroom. All the doors are closed except this one. Lights and sounds of death and destruction seep from the room. It builds and builds, infecting through the living room till the front door opens and Sam, Gray, and Sean enter carrying backpacks and pizza. For the reason alone of just creating a game engine from scratch. Why, why would I dump money into a game that isn't even built yet? Michael, sound! Because it will be owned by the people that have put money into it instead of a company. Isn't it a company that's building it? Yeah, for those who have paid. Michael, sound! The death and destruction dies out and the door slams shut. So how much do we Venmo, Sam? Uh, oh, um, we need twenty-three seventy from you, Gray, for the piece in the toilet paper, and we need fifteen dollars ninety-eight cents from you, Sean, for the pizza, and I need seven hundred twenty-three dollars. Well, we need seven hundred twenty-three dollars seventy cents for pizza, toilet paper, and rent from Michael. He hasn't paid. It's the ninth. Um, looking, um, no, not yet. I, I don't see a confirmation yet. I don't either. Dude, I don't care if his dad was the guarantor or not. He can't be late again. He, he has it. He, he just forgets. No, he just plays. We should talk to him. Michael! What? We need to talk. Yeah, I'm busy. Let's do it. We should just do it. There's no other way he's going to listen. We're late if he doesn't pay by tomorrow. I don't know. That's a lot. We're just snowballing ideas. It's crazy, right? 
I'm in if we have to fight fire with fire. It feels more like we're playing with fire, but... No pressure, but this doesn't work without you, Sam. We were all doing so good. Why tempt it with this? It may be the only way to get through to our friend. I don't think he will listen any other way. Dawn goes to the power breaker in the kitchen. Are you in? <sighs> yeah. He pulls it. We are plunged into darkness, in the darkness. Are you kidding me? Michael stumbles in, banging around into the dark living room. A rage sets in that may change the very nature of his voice. Do you know how far we were into that raid? You couldn't wait 30 minutes? You think stage three opportunities grow on trees? You think 12, tier 12 items drop at a normal drop rates? Lights come up. Sam has a cardboard sword and shield. Gray has little cardboard daggers. Sean has a cardboard staff. They have raid gear on like loud random articles of clothing. What are you doing? You don't want to listen to us. You want to just play that game all day, every day. We're tired of it. We want our friend back. And if this is the only way we can get through to you, so be it. Dressing up in winter clothes, cardboard. Enchanted armor by me, a Torin Risto shaman. Reinforced by my leather working and tailoring. And weaponsmithing by these orc hands. I'm sorry. This is really weird, guys. Uh, this just feels weird. Tim, Head in the game, on. Sean, just like old times. Shake the rest off. Sam, what is this? Most important raid boss we've ever fought. Sam Roars. Ah. Sword. You don't want to return our texts. You ignore our conversations. You're dismissive. I have to get back to my game. Gray, quick, sap him before he gets to his room. Okay. When has sap ever worked on a raid? Like, ever. <laughs> so pathetic for you to even say that. You know the mechanics. Gray rushes in and does a series of quick, short, burst attacks. Oh, stop! That wouldn't even work. Oh, I'm pulling too much aggro. Taunt! Taunt now! Sam, tank if you're gonna tank. You're doing great, though. Sean tosses glitter Sam's way. Hey, dummy. I need you to pay rent on time. I am sick of this. You wait to the last moment, and it looks bad on, on all of us. The rent is already high. Most of us can't afford another huge hike when we resign. Sam hurls his sword axe thingy that's attached to a string. He yanks the sword axe thingy back to him. Touch me again, and it's on like Donkey Kong. Sam looks to his hero friends. They all nod. He powers up, winds up. Sam throws the axe. It's extremely anticlimactic. <laughs> Michael transforms in a way. He jumps up. When he lands, there's a change to the rules of this world. The three heroes fall flat to the ground of the apartment. They all make their way to their feet. Bow before the unending flame! Uh... Michael? Dominate mind! Michael unleashes a series of sticky attacks, Velcro, sticky tape. All heroes are affected. Oh, what did I get hit with? You all left me. This was a gamer's house! It's a damage over time. Guilt. It's a hard hitter, but as long as you stay close, I can heal. It's not our fault you're playing a game we aren't! <clears throat> it's Michael hard. He falls to a knee. I thought you would understand. I thought you were my friends! Cleared the first stage of the battle. How many do you think there are? No idea. Uh, this is our first run. Maybe we're getting through to him. John throws up confetti in one big gesture in the area around them. Michael jumps up with a grand gesture and all the heroes fall to the ground as he lands. Not our fault you're playing. Do you know what it was like? You, you all stopped playing. No more Thursday night raids. You can't just shift games on me like that. You know how hard it is for me to be social. You know how hard it is to run a guild by yourself because your friends don't want to play anymore. Don't want to play? We built a guild from the ground up. Over a hundred guildies recruited by us, counting on us, creating a raid schedule, amending guild rules as new patches come out monthly. It was more than just playing. You all just left. It was too much. 
I had to let go. Had? It's not a burden. It wasn't me. I'm not this orc warrior. Even now, I feel so stupid. I'm the furthest from this in every possible way. So yes, I had to let it go. There are more important things. To you, Sam, don't get too far. This isn't your first rodeo. We don't know how long this stage is. I'm sorry, Michael. We didn't mean to leave you. Uh, we had we all had fun, guys, right? Yeah, the best. Uh, remember when we were doing a mythic raid on the Lich King, and we cleared the final stage, and all of us got lifted in the air. Yeah, Sean screamed. I thought it was a new mechanic. We had never gotten that far. I thought we had wiped. <laughs> but it was the cutscene. Yeah. Good time. But we have real world responsibilities now. It couldn't last forever. I guess. Maybe just not playing all the time. Blanco 2580 misses you. Well, so does Josh and Marsha. You are our leader. We want to see Blanco again. Michael. I'm trying. I'm really trying, but I don't think I can do it. I'm not you. I've had to try to be over these past two months, but it's been so hard keeping everyone together. We lost half the guild. I'm trying to recruit to recoup our losses. It's so hard to just be living in the shadow of how great you were. Everyone wants Blanco 2580 back. Nobody wants me. How do you think that makes me feel? I, I can't. If you came back, together, we could pull everyone back. We could do mythics again without having to do LF on the general chat. Just pop in every once in a while. I'll do everything, but just be there for us. I can't. It's too much. It's just this... This idea everyone had of me, that's just not true. And for the first time in a long time, I feel, I feel like I have time on my own. My own time. I just don't think it's, it's a healthy hobby, hobby anymore. For me, I don't need it. You don't need it? <sighs> Or us. Just take close for heels. You're pushing it. Wait. Sam goes to his friend Michael. There is a break from this world as he tries to comfort his friend. I'm sorry. We did have a lot of fun, right? Yeah. Best. But the hardest step is one that starts a new journey. Yeah? You just have to blindly trust. If anything, that we'll all be fine. That we'll all work out. Okay? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Thank you, Sam. You always knew the right words to say! Michael takes Sam's sword and whacks it. <laughs> Sam falls back. Disarmed?! Why, Michael? I will blindly trust Sam. I will take this step to become the greatest guild on the server. I will pull everyone back, and I will take the very thought of you out of the minds of your ignorant followers. When I am done with you, they won't as much whisper your name in chat. I will burn your name from their lips. Bow before the unending flame. M Michael jumps up, and as he comes down, they all fall. Lights and sound of death and destruction seep from the room again, like the beginning. He's hitting so hard. Sam, do something. It's too much, keeping you both alive. Uh, oh, Sam, help. 
Ah. Hey, Flounders. <laughs> Sean, Flounders. How does it feel to finally taste defeat? Any last words? I will save you. This isn't the end of this, Michael. There is no more Michael. Witness, Sam. You were such a good leader. Witness my first step. Michael steps towards Sam. Wax him. Sam <clears throat> flounders. Lights and so sounds of death and destruction seep from the room. It builds and builds, infecting through the living room until Michael closes the door after walking back in. Lights go back to normal. The heroes stir. It's been a while since I've liked his heels. It wasn't your fault. You're rusty. We're, we're not, rusty. We're not geared. We're out of practice. Outmatched. Gray's phone bloops. No, oh, account notification. He paid rent. See, it all worked out. Yeah, I guess it did. Sam, you're awfully quiet. This means war. Lights down. Oh. <laughs> 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 Wow. <laughs> that was a fun close up. <laughs> um the cool. inspired from last night personally. <laughs> this mean four. Cool. So um I've just got some react some just general reactions and then I took a couple specific things and I figure um Oscar and, and Mario probably wanna sound off on some of the things we were listening for too. Um I felt like we were much more comfortable with it. Mm, yes. Right? So we, we made it a little bit more our own, but in some places we seemed a little too comfortable. Like it just, some of the things that were happening seemed a little casual in places. Does that make sense? Um, like the stakes weren't as high as they needed to be in a couple of places like we had, we had tried to shoot for the other day. Right, like nothing surprised us as much as it did the other day. I felt like we made more discoveries the last time we read through this and, and we kind of saw it coming a little bit more today, which like on one hand, we were a little bit more familiar with the lines and the characters, so that was a good thing. Yeah. But we still need to like reinvest in the, the surprises and the discoveries that, that happen along the way. Um, well, like today is it's uh it's it isn't a normal day in the lives of these. Right. So it, I mean, it even starts not so normal, but we get a little glimpse of the normalcy of sort of the relationship of these people, right? And then when he hasn't paid rent yet, boom, we got to do something drastic, right? And and I think uh, it felt a little too much. Like, well, it's. Tuesday. Well, let's, 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 let's Tuesday. Uh, like let's watch Inside Edition yeah. or or whatever. You know what? It, like it didn't. It, uh, uh, but for so, me, it was so Tuesday. I, th I think I think it, we could help that by being a little bit more conspiratorial on page two, right? Like after we we find out he didn't pay rent. Um, okay, okay, it's time. We're gonna do the thing that we've been sort of toying with. Right, but that's such an, a big plot point. Oh. Um, Excuse me. Because at first we're we're trying to get his attention of we got to talk to him, but then at some point where there's a shift at the uh, bottom of the page, there. Okay, instead of just talking to him, let's do the thing we've been musing about and making cardboard weapons for. Right? Like, let's do it. All of a sudden, I think the stakes get bumped way up there. And if all of that page, I think, can be a little bit more, um, him not paying rent kind of throws down the gauntlet of the frustration. And then we get conspiratorial. And then all of a sudden, let's go for it. You know what I mean? And it all kind of felt like the same thing that was going on on that page, as opposed to maybe three big steps in the ladder of higher stakes and ganging up on Michael. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, page three. 
I'm on the bottom of the page. Uh, and I think Mike, Michael could be more surprised by it. Like, what the hell are these people doing? These, these guys have spent, I would imagine, several hours making these costumes and cardboard weapons. Do you know, like, uh, oh, what are we doing? You know, what the hell's going on here? And they, did, like, and they did it without us completely even knowing about it. Right. Like, so the... Like game or whatever, you know? Right. So it, it's the what are you doing, uh, I think, could have a little bit more surprise behind it, Michael, that, that, that he's just... I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I just, I, I, I'm also trying to like, like I, I am trying to keep it lower than the previous outburst because I'm just like, compl I'm just nonplussed by this. I'm like, what, what? Like, well, I'm still I'm trying you, to wrap my brain you can, around. Yeah, you, yeah, exactly. You can be nonplussed. <laughs> I, I don't think it needs to be a big outburst. Yeah. Um, I'll, but, I'll, but what you just did was really great. Like that, like what the hell is going on here? You know, it, it needs to have that um, feeling of I'm trying to figure out what is happening. What are these morons doing? You know. Yeah. Um, page four. Oh, and you know, Oscar, I'd love to hear what you think about this too. But um, after Michael asks, "What is this uh, most important raid boss we've ever fought?" and then Sam roars, and I feel like maybe the decision to really go all in on the game playing for Sam happens before the the line, mm. right? And the roar is just part of that. You know, or the exclamation point at the end of that. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Because I feel yeah. like, I feel like right now you're you're making the decision to go all in on the roar yeah, the line. Yeah. Ooh, right. But I but I think it happens prior Before to that. that. Yeah. Well, so that was a little segment of our rehearsal uh, and uh, and the play that we're working on. Um, Obviously, I'm not Clay, I'm Teddy Lytle. I'm one of the actors in that uh, uh, performance, uh, but we do have Dewey here. And so I just wanted to pass it off to Dewey. Uh, it might be interesting seeing a rehearsal played back to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it makes me realize how badly I need a haircut in these times. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> um, yeah, I think there was, wasn't there a question that, that I saw come across about one of the hardest things about uh, moving a rehearsal online I think for me, I, I've been amazed like how well it's gone considering the circumstances that we're all in different rooms and in different states often. Um, and so that's that's been really interesting. So th th there's a, a freedom that we can be in different places literally and, and have rehearsal, which is great. Um, I think the trickiest part about it is um, you know, that actor chemistry that you get only when you're in the room together and the getting to know each other as an artist. Um, you know, I've never met any of you before. So, uh, you know, uh, there, there, there seems to be sort of like a layer we have to get through, right? And I feel like we, you know, after three rehearsals and some conversations, we've started to get through that layer a little bit, but it's still I not the same as it would be in person. Not right. as much as we would if we were in person, yes. Right. I think that would happen a lot quicker, the yeah. get to know you phase, the like figuring out how people communicate phase would happen a lot quicker in person than it does in this. Yeah, and this was, I think, from our third day of rehearsal. And I, I do think um, one of the reasons we didn't use some of the earlier stuff is that we found it was just a lot of us chatting and getting to know each other because it seemed like without that immediate contact, we needed some kind of um, other means of, of doing that. Right. Uh, a, a question I have for you, Dewey, is this your first time working with people on the spectrum or have you worked with people on the spectrum before? Um, I, I have some students. Um, I, I teach at the University of South Carolina Aiken where Clay went to school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have some students that are on the spectrum. Um, so it's not the first time I've worked with actors on the spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, but, but Maybe this is the the most people on the spectrum in one cast, you know? Very yeah, exciting. for sure. Yeah. Um, so, can, can I make a point, Teddy? Um, cool. 
One thing I, I was thinking through that whole video, and I, I'm not sure exactly who was recording it, but I know when I have the, uh, the Zoom app up here, I always have it in gallery mode, and that was obviously in um, the other mode. I just felt it would have been a little more, uh, people watching this would have been a little more, would have seen more if it had been in gallery mode, you know, because then you can see everyone has the right. same, you know, instead of seeing who's talking. Yeah, yeah that, I was kind of surprised that it wasn't in gallery mode because yeah. when I was when I was watching the rehearsal, I think the first rehearsal I might have done it on my phone, but then I purposely moved to my computer so that I could, you know, see you all at the same time in gallery mode in rehearsal. Yeah. I think that's a great point. This, this goes back to those challenges is that like we were planning on recording <laughs> rehearsals and we I think we thought we were recording it in gallery mode. But we were, like, yeah, really. uh, but we, but yeah, we, we, that is definitely a lesson we learned that gallery mode works much better. Um, being able to see everyone communicate non-verbally as they're like doing these little acting in, in this acting to a, a box. Yeah. Right. Um, I will say for me, rehearsal and performance, the, the biggest challenges of moving it online is also, um, you know, I think where my skill set and, and the thrill of acting comes for me is that immediate interaction and being able to feed off the audience and, and use that. Um, but it was nice to, uh, when we were rehearsing, to still be able to like interact with faces like the Brady. Mm -hmm. Um and so I know that's that's been an interesting thing. Yeah, and, and I think it's interesting, even if people couldn't see us do this, they could kind of, if, if Jim or I were, would say something with our screen off, but those of us who weren't speaking mm -hmm. turned our screens off, you know, turned our cameras off so that we were only seeing the actors in the rehearsal when we were reading through the script. And I thought that was really useful because mm -hmm. We didn't see the playwright go, ah, uh, you know, like <laughs> in the middle of somebody reading a line, right? So, um, yeah. you know, and, and I think that's been a really interesting component of this developing a new play. We've got the playwright in the room, we've got the dramaturg there, the director there, the stage manager there. And so I think it, it could be easy as an actor to get distracted by people's reactions, but that's a nice thing to be able to do that you can't do in person yeah. is by <laughs> muting that person, right? Yeah. yeah. To, to, to piggyback on that, it, it is kind of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, we're able to see everyone's reactions in, you know, when we're all together, but in this medium, you know, we can, some, certain individuals can shut off the screens and, you know, it, it, on the one hand, it prevents people from seeing some reactions that might have a negative in fact, impact, but it also, on the other hand, prevents them from seeing good reactions, you know? True. True. Yep. Sure. Yep. Uh, Dan, can I ask you, uh, being uh, someone on the spectrum, how do you feel working on a play like this? I mean, a specific play? Um, yeah. But let, let, the topic is an interesting one. Um, it has so many facets and it can be interpreted so many ways. I mean, the whole point of the script is that it works with um, addiction to video games, but it can go it can be applied to any form of addiction. Um, at the same point, when you look at the specific detail of video game addiction, we're trying to prevent, we're trying to present a, a certain message that while video game addiction is different from other addictions in that there are some benefits and drawbacks to it where most other addictions are, you know, mostly for, you know, drawbacks, but, you know, it, we're trying not to vilify um, character of Michael, but at the same point, pointing out some of his flaws. And same with the the rest of the cast. You know, I think I I that was really well put. I think the only word I would change there is uh, instead of Michael's flaws, I'd say his challenges. Because um, as he says, yep. the the video game itself isn't the problem. It actually is a, a mode for him to communicate and to socialize. Yep. Yep. Um, but it's how do you balance that? And actually someone in our uh, Facebook message uh, mentioned that they felt uh, very seen and they could relate to this. It was hitting home for them. Yeah. Uh, and and um, everyone needs a balance of living in the real world and adulting and fun and to change that relationship and stuff can be hard. Yeah. Um, I think I also loved the sense of community from this piece. That they, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, more so than friends, they're brothers. They fight like brothers. Yeah. Um, 
even, uh, even when one appears to turn on the other or the others turn on that one, depending on how you interpret it, um, right. even when that happens, there's still, there's still this camaraderie there, you know? Um, it's very palpable, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Dewey, I don't know if you had any other thoughts. We're about to close up. We have about five minutes left. Yeah, no, I think it's 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 a, it's a great play, and I, you know, I think that um, uh, we were talking with Oscar, the playwright, about it. W you know, did he really write these characters as characters on the spectrum? Maybe, maybe not. You know, and I think we're still trying to determine, yeah. you know, uh, all of that. But I, well, I think what was so exciting is that uh, the connection that all the actors found with the piece, and that uh, it's obviously it's something that resonates with people, right? This the sense of community that can be formed in a different way mm. in the gaming world than in the real world and how that has real world implications. And, um, and, and you know, to me, the whole thing is about friendship and how the dynamics of the friendship have changed and gotten out of whack and how they're trying to, to get them back. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I also would say this is the, I think the second draft we went through, the first draft yep. was the first day and then uh, Oscar uh, 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 went back and, and um, made some adjustments. And I do think those adjustments addressed uh, yeah. some of our current concerns. Like Dan said, the vil uh, vilifying Michael, um, also not vilifying video games, finding that gray area. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. also and also, you know, to, to piggyback on Dewey's point, I mean, yes, you know, the, you, know you, you could make an argument that all four characters are somewhere on the spectrum, but again, it shows that it is indeed a spectrum. I mean, there's, you know, and, and and again, it's not meant to show necessarily autism at all. I mean, it's 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 part of it, but it is not the focus of it. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. It's a piece of the pie. It's not the entire. It's, a, exactly. it's an ingredient. It's not the. It's not yeah. the. It's it, the it's the sugar in the pie, not the not the not, not the <laughs> entire darn pie. You know. <laughs> Uh, Dan, thank you for saving my metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and we don't have any more questions. I do want to say, Dewey, it has been such a pleasure working with you. I'm so excited to continue engaging with you. I agree. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you guys in person in the summer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is just one of the plays uh, we're developing. Uh, for the Neurodiversity New Play Festival this summer. Um, and they have a wide variety of, of immediate topics, but they're all under the theme meeting uh, neurodiversity, uh, meeting autism. And um, we're so excited about that. Uh, I think this has been a delightful conversation. It's so good to see you guys again. Yep. Uh, yep. And uh, I know I think we have a little time before we continue working on that, but hopefully we'll uh, continue, continue to delve deeper into that. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. With that actually, I'm handing it directly over to Clay, who's going to close out our conference with uh, um, uh, actually talking about our neuro, uh, Neurodiversity New Play Festival. Um, so Dewey, thank you so much. Dan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, guys. For having us. Have a great, uh, have a great rest of your day. Uh, and with that, I'm going to slide out of, out of view, and Clay's going to slide into view. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Uh, so we're winding down on day one, but we still have one last presentation to go, which actually I'm doing. And I don't know if I've introduced myself. My name is Clay Martin, and I'm the artistic director of Spectrum Theater Ensemble. Um, before I get into our last topic and presentation, though, I wanted to just make sure that we thanked again uh, some of the people who made this conference and our work possible. Uh, first, we would like to thank uh, Thea Rogers and HowlRound. Uh, Thea has been amazing today working uh, behind the scenes to make sure all of these videos and everything uh, is, comes off smoothly to y'all. Um, and thank you, HowlRound, so much for co-hosting this conference. Again, we want to also thank uh, Spartina Consulting, who helped us develop the conference, and the funding from Rhode Island Foundation that made that possible. We'd also like to thank the Rhode Island State Council for the Arts for their support of the Neurodiversity Matters uh, Conference and the Neurodiversity New Play Festival. 
uh, and the Prone Family Foundation, which has been a tremendous supporter of SCE uh, in all ways. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that we thank them uh, now. Uh, with that being said, a lot of times during this conference, we've talked about uh, this thing, the Neurodiversity New Play Festival. Um, and I wanted to take a minute to share with you, the audience, what that is, uh, what the development has gone into it, and some of the goals that we have. Uh, this festival has been a uh, idea in the head of SCE leadership and company members almost since we formed that we realized that there just aren't that many plays with different representations of neurodiverse individuals and uh, we're a neurodiverse company so we realized that the um, amount of canon there was to uh, authentically represent our members uh, didn't really exist so uh, instead of worrying about that we decided to start creating it. So uh, with that, I'm gonna share a PowerPoint that explains the festival to you. All right. So the SCE Neurodiversity New Play Festival um, is happening this summer from June 22nd to August 2nd. Uh, and it's in partnership with the Miracle Project New England, who you heard about earlier today, as well as Brown University's Department of Theater and Performance Studies. Um, now we know that those dates fall in an uncertain time, and uh, we'll talk later about some of the uh, contingencies and adjustments we've made for that. But first, I want you to understand the festival itself, which in its essence is not going to change no matter how it's presented. Um, so what is the Neurodiversity New Play Festival? Uh, in 2020, Spectrum Theater Ensemble uh, is launching a partnership with Brown University to create accessible programming for a community of neurodiverse artists and audiences. Uh, so the Neurodiversity New Play Festival has five key components. Um, the first is the 10 minute play festival, which you just saw a, a portion of a rehearsal for uh, with Dewey, Dan and Teddy. Um, so what we realized was that uh, access points to in, interacting and participating in theater. Um, as I remember them growing up, some of the first plays that I did in high school and college were 10 minute plays, which were short enough to memorize as you're learning the art, um, but also had enough material to really grasp characters and find audition pieces, things like that. So we wanted to make a series of 10 minute plays that were geared around neurodiverse characters. Um, our resident playwright, Jeremy Camps, who's uh, worked with us since the beginning is amazing. And he spent uh, over a year reaching out to playwrights that he trusted and really um, felt like were collaborative great minds uh, to bring in to that we would commission to write new plays uh, with our company in mind. Um, so uh, we worked with them for the last few months. You just saw a section of our spring workshop and all of these playwrights along with guest directors will either come to Providence this summer or be working with us online to, de to finish developing these plays, not only in English, but also translated into Spanish so that they can be accessible to as many people as we can possibly um, do at this time. So component two uh, is the final workshop of our play, The Importance of Being a Play in Earnest, which is by our resident playwright, Jeremy Camps. Uh, this play has been developed over the last uh, two years um, by STE and Jeremy, and was made to uh, be a play that had many different neurodiverse characters uh, that had different personalities, different identities, um, without the play singularly being about the concept of autism. Uh, we've been workshopping it with Trinity Rep and last summer with Brown University with their Neurodiversity Conference. And we'll do the final workshop of it this year before our world premiere of it in 2021. Um, so, sorry, the third uh, portion of the festival, component of the festival, and the one I might be the most excited about right now is that we realized that we were bringing in these great playwrights to work with neurodivergent actors and thus create neurodiversity. Um, and we had always planned to one day uh, have writers on the spectrum in the room as well. But we realized when we were developing the festival pretty early on that 
there's no reason to wait. So we uh, contacted and reached out uh, to find writers on the spectrum and asked them to solicit submissions uh, for our festival. And tomorrow at the end, at this time tomorrow, we'll be announcing four plays that have been selected and will receive a brief workshop, rehearsal, and a reading at the end of our festival. Um, we're very excited about that and excited to let everyone know who those playwrights are in their plays. Uh, so that's our third component. And the fourth component is with our partner, The Miracle Project, New England. Uh, the Miracle Project uh, runs a summer camp that does more theater training rather than play development and production. And they'll run a camp concurrent with our festival during the first week that we hope will then bridge collaboration and bringing some of their members uh, into work on the new development of plays and other work that we will create during the festival time. Uh, MPE is a great organization uh, and I can't say enough about that partnership. All right. And then finally, component five is our NICE certification launch. So NICE is, and I'm gonna get this uh, acronym wrong probably, uh, is the Neurodiverse Inclusive Certified Entertainment, which is something SE has been developing the concept of since we began, of finding a way to um, implement a set of uh, standards and codification for sensory friendly entertainment so that it can be more understandable and, accept, um, and accepted and uh, bring up the awareness of it through the community throughout the country. Uh, during the summer, we will be working with a few uh, initial pilot programs to help other theaters implement their sensory friendly uh, training and programming so that they can make their entire seasons accessible to people with neurodiverse needs. Uh, this includes people on the spectrum, but also people with other neurological uh, sensitivities such as PTSD um, or, um, or trouble with strobing lights, things like that. Um, we're very excited about this launch and there'll be more information to come on our website about that soon. So um, some core goals uh, for the festival. Uh, again, it's to develop original works that expand the theatrical canon, including uh, roles of, for many different kinds of people with ASD. Uh, also to challenge the misconception about ASD and educate artists in the community on how to work with individuals on the spectrum. We also wanna create opportunities for neurodiverse collaboration and develop career and social skills, both for our, uh, our acting company and by bringing in other people from other organizations into our process, hopefully opening the door to them to explore a potential career or at least a passion in performing theater. Uh, we also wanna cultivate relationships with prominent playwrights, designers and administrators and directors for future collaboration with SCE. Now, this is not because we need a bunch of attention, but rather that we want to have these people who are leaders in our industry understand both what the benefits of working with neurodiverse artists are and how similar it is to working with any other kind of artists so that we can destroy any kind of barriers or myths through the industry that working with people on the spectrum is, in, um, is especially challenging or different in any way than it's different to work with any kind of actor. Um, we also want to develop a working relationship between SCE and MP&E, which are both uh, based in Providence, Rhode Island, and serve a very similar mission. So this festival will start to bring that collaboration together between the two organizations. And then lastly, we want to further foster a relationship between SCE and the Department of Theater and Performance Studies at Brown, because we find that while professional production is great, an educational component of it is always valuable. Uh, I'm 36 years old, I've been working in theater for 15 years, and I cannot foresee a day where I couldn't learn something more about theater or how to do this better. Uh, and working with Spectrum Theater Ensemble has proven that more than anything else in my life. Uh, so we believe that partnering with education institutions is a um, amazing uh, potential for uh, spreading neurodiverse inclusion through the arts. So, um, the big question that you're probably all going to ask is, how are we adjusting to the coronavirus outbreak? Um, this is an interesting topic that we were lucky to be thinking about early on in our development process. 
um, and have a model that we think may work regardless of what the conditions are. So first, our stage managers, as you saw Jim Armstrong, have been contracted early to start to think of procedures and prepare signage and other things to keep visitors and artists safe uh, in whatever kind of venue that we're gonna be in or whatever the model of our rehearsals will be. Um, so our rehearsals and meetings will be broken into separate rooms and limit to groups under the health guidelines. Uh, the great thing about 10 minute plays is that they usually don't have more than four to six characters. So even with a playwright and a director in the room, you can still say under 10 people at any given time. Uh, and then if we have other artists such as designers or respondents collaborating, we're gonna have some of those people would be in separate rooms observing the rehearsals via video, but in the same way you're able to interact with us, be able to live connect to the process happening in the room. Um, that's if we're able to work in a space. If we're working online, you can see through this conference how we've been developing tools for that. Um, now, alternative ways to connect with the public. Um, we have many different uh, options that we're considering for this. Of course, streamed and recorded readings like we're doing right now for our conference and talkbacks throughout the festival, which we're already starting to engage amazing artists and individuals on the spectrum to uh, bring more topics to the public uh, through the festival. Um, site visits by small groups. The great thing about 10 minute plays as a model is that because they're so short, we can repeat them five to eight times in an hour. And that's still only the length of a regular play. So we could move groups of five to 10 people to see a play at once so that they're not close to each other and don't violate any guidelines while still being able to have 50 to 100 people see any given performance. Um, multiple venues, short play, small audiences, like I just described, and added attention to getting the word out and press coverage for the festival, which is the way that you can help us by spreading the word about the festival so that regardless of what medium we have it in, we know that our audience and the people uh, both in the autism population and in the theater industry know about this work. So for more information uh, about this and anything regarding the festival, you can email us at info at stensemble.org. You can also, and we would kindly ask that you like us at facebook.com slash stensemble and check out our website, www.stensemble.org. And lastly, please, if you can, support the Neurodiversity New Play Festival. One thing I'm very proud of is that through our history, approximately 90% of our funding goes directly to artists and paying artists for their work, which I know in this time is something that is very important. Um, so know that your money will be used well and that it will go to help people both on the spectrum and professional artists continue to create this amazing, amazing work that we've been doing. And with that, I think we're at the end of our session today. Please tune in tomorrow again at 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. We'll have a whole nother array of panels and workshops and a clip of the reading from The Importance of Being by Jeremy Camps. Um, we hope you can join us. You can check out our schedule on our Facebook site and our website. Um, so please join us there and again, share with any of your friends. Have a great night.